Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Julie Mann and I'm a professional network marketer. I'm an actor and I'm also an EFT practitioner. And today I'm joined by the lovely Sharon Bott. Hello Sharon. Hello Julie. <laughs> I'm so pleased to see you. Actually, I know that there are many, many things that you do. You're a coach, you're a mentor, you're a trainer, but you're also an actor. Yes, yes. And I'm thinking, where do we start? But actually, what I'd really like to do is start back in 1976, when I think you went to drama college. What happened then? I know, time warp. Anyway, yeah. because, um, yeah, I'd love to, to know really um, how it was, whether you'd always wanted to be an actor, you know, whether that's a dream that you had. You know, I remember 76 as being a year when there was a drought, there was, you know, incredible heat waves. Long, hot summer, wasn't it? Yeah, so how was that long, hot summer at drama school? Well, um, so drama school started in the autumn of 76. The summer of 76, I was actually in Cornwall teaching English as a foreign language to a bunch of students. I just graduated from uni, so I did English and drama. I wanted to be an actor from, well, actresses. We were called actresses in the 70s. Let's face it, not actors. Um, I'd wanted to act since I think I was about three years old and I recited a poem to my mum's friends at a coffee morning and I got applause and it was like this is a drug I want more in, in my own three-year-old way so I'd done loads of and um, dram and stuff like that um, got talked into going to uni you know get a degree then we might you know then you can do this silly thing on the side so I went to, I went to Bristol, did English and drama, loved it, spent all my time acting until that kind of panicky bit before finals when it's like, oh, I've actually got to read some, you know, write some essays, do some books now. Then went and did a year at the drama studio in Ealing, which was bliss. Because for the first time in my life, I was 24 seven doing what I loved and it was what I was supposed to be doing as opposed to stealing time from other things. And then I, I went on and, and acted for a while and still do on and off. Love it. Yes, me too. I mean, I remember actually drama college being the best fun as well. Yeah. I also remember when I left college, it being a bit like, oh my goodness, out in the big wide world, getting a job, a whole different ball game. So, so what was your acting career like when you first started? And, what, and, and how did um, it progress? My first, very first job, my first year, how I got my equity card, which was the crucial big step that was so difficult because you couldn't get an equity card without a job and you couldn't get a job without an equity card. And I was lucky, I got a job doing TIE, Theatre in Education, with a little band of nutters. And we went round the Yorkshire countryside going to schools and village halls and devising our own shows. It was wonderful um, and such a lesson in being real because when you're working with kids, any pretend stuff, and I mean pretend as opposed to imagination because they're very different things. Pretending is, for me, is fake. Imagining is real, no matter how bonkers it is, if, if that kind of distinction makes sense. Um, so with kids, whether I was playing, you know, an old boot or a policeman or a little girl, it had to be real. It had to be authentic. So it was a brilliant teaching ground. Um, and, and from that, I, I did loads of rep and bits of uh, little film roles, little uh, telly roles. I love, I always loved live theatre way more than the whole filming thing where for me I was just part of this huge machine and it was never about my performance, it was about, you know, is the, is the lens clear, is, is, is there quiet on the set, all of that, which was such a technical exercise that I got distracted, very easily distracted, whereas on stage with a live audience and th that whole dynamic of just being in it and holding it and the license to you know because it's just you on the stage and your fellow actors and 
connecting with them joyous joyous experience i could you know, i've loved every bit i felt very privileged to be able to you know to to play in that arena for large chunks of my life yeah me too actually talking of distractions every so often you move your head and there's this very like bright blue sort of orb thing happening yeah. all very spooky but do you not have orbs around you julie have you not got your own little <laughs> it's the it's the glass door and a light onto the street i'll i'll do my best to keep my head still no but for goodness sake don't do that you'd be as animated as you like so i know that you and your husband both do voiceovers and actually you have your own the studio don't you at home which is fantastic oh that sounds awfully grand well you can record it's, a voiceover on it it's it's a it's an upstairs bedroom that's got things a bit like egg boxes on the walls um and uh, fortunately, I am the least techie person in the world. Me and technology, not the best of friends. Husband loves a bit of tech. It's his porn, you know? He just loves microphones, gizmos, gadgets, apps. He loves all of that. So he does all of the, the, the editing and, and puts these things on that make me sound wonderful. And um, I just go and sit at the mic and have a lovely time. So yeah, we do quite a lot of voiceover work. Which Great is teamwork. Great yeah, teamwork. perfect. So, you know, I know that you then began life as a coach as well. So what had you yeah. coaching into the mix? I've been a self-help personal development junkie most of my life. You know, once I got into my teens and discovered there were these books out there, um, and I just found it fascinating. I loved it. Uh, I even dabbled for a while when, when my kids were small of going back to uni again and doing a, a degree in, in psych psychology or psychotherapy. I got, you know, training as a psychotherapist, discovered that was going to take way too many years and way too much money. So, so I didn't. Um, and then uh, it, this is really interesting experience for me, Julie. I'm much better at listening than I am at talking. And it's really odd for me to be in the position of doing the talking. I'm dying to ask you questions and listen to your answers. Well, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that later. Maybe you could do an episode of this where you get interviewed. Maybe, maybe. Okay, so um, anyway, anyway, yeah, we've all had our ups and downs, haven't we, in life? We obviously know, especially the older we get, that you know, there's no plain sailing. It doesn't matter what you're going for. Life is challenging, and every day we're faced with challenges. Oh, so, what are some of the things that you've had to overcome in your life? So that's it's a really interesting question because do you know i've been really blessed really blessed i had i had happy family life as a kid i've had a very long and happy marriage no massive traumas dramas and i've always felt um that that i i didn't deserve that so i am not one of those people who has an extraordinary story to tell. What has dogged me through life is that I didn't really deserve all this good fortune. I think the official title for it is imposter syndrome. The I'm not good enough that has dogged me every step of the way. And it was probably that that had me get so interested in all the personal development and do all the training and get the qualifications and train as a counsellor and and I did the landmark curriculum and and was a an introduction leader with them for a while um that, that somehow I've had to justify my good fortune and that I didn't deserve my my good fortune um and that I I guess I'm always waiting to be found out and have people say, well, actually, you're not that great, are you? 
which is why I'm a better listener than talker because I'm less likely to get found out then. So um, it, it's a very dull story. It's a very run of the mill story about just never ever feeling good enough. I have now discovered that um, as with so many things, our habits of thinking, our ways of looking at ourselves, what we give our focus to is, is so crucial. So I have developed over the time, over the years, endless years, ways of dealing with my own nonsense. Bollocks, bollocks we call it. Um, so the work that I do now, we've actually trademarked the term bollocks. It's not a rude word, Julie. Um, <laughs> it stands for beliefs often limit life's opportunities, constantly killing success. And I know for me, my, my bollocks, my misguided belief, um, it's not that I'm the greatest in the world. We're all just doing our best and we're all magnificent. And so many people I've learned, discovered, do suffer from this imposter syndrome. And that belief stops us challenging ourselves, stops us doing stuff, stops us stepping outside of our comfort zone. Um, and th there are two little kind of twists that I found invaluable for me when I find myself saying, oh, I can't do that. That's too hard. Um, which I find all the time with tech. <laughs> oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't learn this new program, whatever. I simply twist that into, okay, so what if it were easy? How can I make this easy? And shifting, I can't do that. I can't be interviewed by this extraordinary, amazing Julie Mann on her thing, you know, who am I? Who wants to know about me? Shifting, I can't do that into, what if I could do that? Shifting, I don't know, into what if I did know? And I found that, <laughs> simple as that sounds, it kind of shifts everything and, and enables me to say, Okay, I'm just going to play. If I fail, I'll fail forwards. If I don't, if I say no, I can't, I'm not good enough. I'm just going to stay stuck. Oh my goodness, I absolutely love that. And I think, Sharon, there'll be so many people who can relate to not being good enough imposter syndrome. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Sometimes they don't know it as I'm not good enough. It might be I'm not worthy. I'm not lovable. It could be all sorts of variations. But ultimately, most people have that going on. So that's really brilliant. And yeah. just to... Um, just to touch on what you said about being an imposter, clearly you're not an imposter because I've just got a bit of a testimonial here and it does say, she brings like-minded people together and lets us achieve extraordinary things. Have you always had the ability to do that, do you think? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I love connecting people. I love connecting individuals with their own magnificence and getting them out of their bollocks. I guess that has been a, a theme throughout my life and um, enabling people to, to make choices because choice for me is, is such a magical world world it's a magical world i was going to say magical word it's a magical world as well um because when we recognize that we have a choice i can choose to stay small and stuck in my bollocks of i'm not good enough or i can choose to take a risk i can choose to try something new i can choose to step up and say well i'm gonna do it anyway even if i'm not good enough and i get it wrong you know i i love I think it was Betty Davis who said, we're either green and growing or we're ripe and rotting. So I am determined to my dying day to be green and growing. And when we're growing, we're, we're always messing up, cocking up, falling over, getting it wrong. You know, babies, when they're trying to stand up, how many times do they fall down? Endlessly, that's how they learn to get their balance and it's what we do throughout life. So it's choosing and 
the thing I've always loved about coaching, it's, it's asking people questions. I don't have anybody's answers. Everybody has their own wisdom. We just don't listen to it very often. So empowering, empowering people to, to check in with themselves, find their own light, magnificence, wisdom, answers, whatever it is, and recognize that they have choices. We all have choices every single moment even if it's simply what do i give my focus to absolutely i think sometimes people don't think they have a choice because they don't like the choices that they have but we always have a choice within those choices don't we so, always always yeah. always always so um i know that you are absolutely passionate about light up but there might be a few people listening myself included really that you know has never been aware of what light up is so you know, how did you discover Light Up and what had you choose to go in that direction? Oh, great questions. Um, so I'd been, uh, I'd had my portfolio career, which is how I chose to think of it. Because I noticed that when I said, well, I spin lots of plates, I instant stress because one of these plates was obviously going to fall and crash any moment. So I turned this into a portfolio career and I imagine a beautiful squidgy soft leather like an old Gladstone bag with all these compartments and I could simply go inside and pull out right right now I'm focusing on my voiceover work, my my acting work, my my coaching work, my network marketing work, whatever my family, my whatever it is. So I've been um carrying on with this portfolio career and um, doing lots of coaching other people doing trainings and, and workshops and things I was kind of developing my own brand around it's called simple choice funnily enough and I bumped into somebody uh, who had been to one of my trainings so I vaguely knew and she was just shining I hadn't seen her for a while she looked lit up and I said to her wow, you look amazing. What have you been up to? And she said, I've just done this thing called Light Up. Had I heard of it? No. And she told me about this, this lady called Melanie Pledger. Um, oh, never heard of her. So, and I'd been around personal development a long time. Um, bless you, you're coughing. And, and, <laughs> um, and I thought, well, clearly, I haven't heard of them. Can't be any good. Anyway, long story short, this lady put me in touch with Mel Pledger. She got a real nudge that, that this was an important connection to make. So I spoke to Mel, instant recognition. It was like we'd always, we'd never met. Instant, you know how we, we do just sometimes, a bit like you and I really. It's like, oh, know this person. Um, Mel and I hit it off. She told me about Light Up. I looked at her website, didn't quite get it. Um, and she said, well, you know, just, just go through it with, I've just trained a few people to do it, go through it, experience it for yourself. Head went, seriously, seriously, you've done so much training, you, uh, no, distraction, get on with your own stuff. Something inside went, do it, don't argue, just do it. So I did this, you know, ping pong for a little while. Eventually, of course, I did it thoroughly enjoyed it so so light up is a very simple program very practical very experiential it's simply three steps um which are done over a, a few days two hours one hour two hours so it's really fast great fun there's no going through everything that's happened and all the trauma it's not like conventional talking therapies or or coaching it's great fun um and i came away thinking that was, that was really, I loved that experience. I'd recommend that to anybody. Not sure it's been life changing, honestly. Um, and I've been around coaching for a long time. I've done a lot of work already, I thought. And it was my husband a couple of months later who pointed out to me that he was living with a different woman. That I was, I was like, what are you talking about? And he was, well, you're, you're calmer, you're clearer. <laughs> you don't faff as much me faff 
I, you don't, you're not stressy. You make decisions in a heartbeat. You're just happier. You're sleeping better. And I was like, really? Am I? And I think it's a bit like when we see kids and we haven't seen them for a while and we say, oh my goodness me, you've grown. And they kind of roll their eyes and think, mm, mm, whatever. Because they haven't been aware of their growing. I had been shifting as a result of Light Up and I hadn't even been aware of it. So I can say with confidence, Light Up, it works and it's quite profound and subtle as well as being fast and fun. It's also profound and subtle. So I got really intrigued after this. I trained with Mel. She, she taught me how to deliver it. And I said at the end of that, it was a five day training, no idea what this means. I'm in service to this work. Because that was how um, extraordinary I felt it was. So that was five, six years ago, I don't know, eons ago because it felt, it feels like it's been here all my life. And I've now taken hundreds of people through Light Up myself. I also now, you know, with Mel run the training of new people who want to train how to deliver this. And it's just, it's such a fast way to give people real shift, real practical tools. And I've taken through really successful people you know, clearly I'm not good enough to help them. Light up can. Um, so, you know, successful CEOs of companies, um, people from all sorts of walks of life. I've also worked a lot with people coming out of trauma, out of um, domestic violence, sexual abuse. Um, I've worked with trafficked women, um, people with PTSD, um, service people who've, you know, been been through horrors and in three fun sessions it, it it shifts things because we've all got this light inside that we spend most of our life operating from up here this is how we're we're taught and trained at school it's all about well think about it work it out put your thinking cap on and i iq you know we all know about iq more and more people know about EQ, you know, the emotional, the, the feeling, what goes on in our heart. What we tend to forget about is our, what we call SQ, the soul quotient, which is our gut instinct, our intuition, that, that place which tends to be in our gut where we just know stuff or where something just feels wrong. Or, or something feels so right, we can't kind of make the pieces connect up here. In here though, we know. And what Light Up does really, really fast, and in a very fun way, is get us connecting with that. Brilliant, and of course we know now that um, the gut is considered to be the second brain, isn't it? Yeah. So actually it's very, very powerful. Exactly, and when we get all of those things connected, when we get the brain and our heart and our gut communicating, mm. then, oh my goodness, all those things that people are dealing with at, at the moment, the anxiety, the stress, the you know people who are stuck making decisions, who, you know, that buzzword resilience, that, that schools are so full of and, and companies say, well, what we need in our people is resilience, resilience to cope with change and new circumstances and, and all of that. We don't get that up here. Our wellspring, our source is in here. This is what makes goal setting, you know, piece of cake. Can I, can I just play something? Can yeah. I just play something with you? Okay, right. So, Julie, just stick your arm up in the air and reach up as high as you can. Really, just as, as high as you can. Brilliant, well done. Now, just reach a little bit higher. Mm. It is possible. What happened? Uh, it felt like another inch, actually. Yeah, it, it yeah. looked at least an inch. Now, interesting thing was, First time, let's just check this. 
I said to you, go as high as you can, reach as high as you can. And you thought you did. Yes. Yeah. So when I said, now just go a little bit further, what you didn't do was look up, work out where your goal was, work out a strategy for reaching that extra bit before you did it. You simply, from somewhere inside, found the wherewithal to do that. That's how simple it is. That's great, isn't it? Love that. So I know you talked about the fact that you help people who are very successful. You've also talk, um, talked about helping people who have really been through massive traumas. What, you know, what is the, the kind of thing that people say they want generally? Maybe that's, maybe you can't really do it generally, but do people come to you and say, this is missing or, or this is what I'm looking for? You know, how come people approach you in the first place? Um, I think often people are questioning themselves that they've, they've reached barriers or they've got their feelings stuck. They know there's something else and they have no idea how to access it. Um, a, a, a way that a client described it to me afterwards, which I rather like, she said, it's a bit like when you're, you're, you're in your car driving along and you've got a mucky windscreen. It's, it's covered in, in, you know, grunge and dead flies and, and things. And it, it gets quite hard to see. She said, light up is just like you get out and you clean the windscreen, you get back in the car and it's just like, oh gosh, that's so much easier. So uh, people often come because their windscreen in life has got a bit mucky and they're not quite sure how to clean it. And interestingly, one of the, the questions, because we always start off in, in doing Light Up by taking what we call the history or, or the herstory, if we're talking to a, a female of the species. Because <laughs> <laughs> it can't all be history. You know, it can be herstory as well. Um, and one of the, the things as an activator I always say to people is, um, this is a great opportunity to get clear on what it is you want. Um, you know, what do you want out of life? What, what is it you want out of your future? Um, and it, it's fascinating people's answers. Sometimes it is about external goals. Much more often it's about, I just want to believe in myself again, or I want to, to find the confidence to, to take the next step. I want to get unstuck. I want to live to my full potential and I know I'm not doing it at the moment. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Brilliant. So um, if there's someone watching who doesn't feel like lit up, um, is, there a, is there some simple thing they could do today that would start to make a difference perhaps? Um, so one of the things that, that is another thread of light up which I, I say to people throughout is just notice notice what you're feeling notice what's happening notice what's going on in your gut because so often we're so focused up here and our body can be screaming at us if we've ignored it for a long time it can also be giving us kind of little gentle nudges and unless we tune in and start noticing what we notice and allowing ourselves to feel whatever it is we're feeling without judging it simply noticing and noticing without judging gives us a whole new aspect and i think at the moment we're all feeling a lot of stuff that we're not quite sure how to to label, to, um, to, to deal with, whether it's, you know, the kind of deep existential anxiety of what's happening in the world and, you know, all of that, that fear and uncertainty that's coming up. And people are, are dealing with big, big stuff at the moment because so much of what felt like it was just set and was going to keep happening, it's, it's all blooming, changing. And when we we judge it from the place of fear up here 
it, you know, we're in a downward spiral. If we can simply notice what we're noticing, feel what we're feeling. And a little, a game we play in, in Light Up um, is one to 10 in a word. Simple as that. Just right now, in this moment, because now is all we've got, just on a scale of one to 10, how am I feeling? It, you know, is it a 10 and woohoo? Or is it two and exhausted or four and anxious or six and wobbly or, you know, what is it? So a number, one being absolute pants and 10 being fabulous and a word to describe that. That gives us a launch pad from which we can say, okay, so what, what could make me feel better? What could I do for myself right now in this minute? What could I give my focus to? What can I physically, you know, do I just, am I, am I too and sluggish? Okay, let's, let's get up and move. It's, it's a launch pad. So often we ignore or we resist what's going on. And, you know, what we resist persists. Yes, and it can turn to illness, can't it? And now exactly. are screaming at us and people aren't, aren't listening. That's yeah. a really great little, um, a simple little... It, it, uh, it's so simple. It takes seconds and it instantly puts us back in tune with ourselves. Brilliant. And then we've got a choice where we go from there. Totally. So how can people find out more about you, Sharon? Um, www.dnalightup.net that simple and you're on linkedin which is how can we find each other on it? linkedin i'm i'm on facebook you know have a sharon bot have a have a look for me there dm me send me a send me a message or you know let's have a chat with me i'm very happy to talk to anybody about light up um and you know I'll, I'll be able to tell you very quickly if this is something that well you you will be able to know for yourself if this is something that that is going yeah yeah go on whatever whatever when you get that and the, 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 the dna of dna light up um we don't actually do dna testing it stands for the three steps of light up which is discover which is about finding practical, really practical tools that we can play with, simple tools that ongoingly make a difference. Engage, which is about engaging with ourselves as well as engaging with other people and finding the keys to make that connection. And activate, which is where we, we bring it all together, head, heart and gut, so that they're communicating and we really connect with our our inner light you know that knowing inside wonderful so any last words of wisdom before we close oh this is where i i feel i i should say something utterly <laughs> oh, you know, oh wow that's good i like that um I would say to everyone, no matter what your head and your habits are telling you, you are magnificent. And when we recognize our own magnificence and the fact that all of us, every single person is magnificent. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Sharon Bott, thank you so very much. Julie Mann, thank you. It's been a joy. Thank you.